we may start now. Okay. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. I hope you, everyone is enjoying Latin 2020. I hope you are enjoying the great talks, and I hope you have been able to talk to other participants as in a usual conference. As you may know, two prizes will be given in this edition of Latin, the Alejandro Lopez Ortiz Best Paper Award and the Imre Simon Test of Time Award. Thanks to our sponsorship agreement with Springer, in this edition of Latin, we were able to offer a cash award of 500 euros to each prize and we have decided to split equally between the two awards, the amount of 1,000 euros offered by Springer. So I'm here to tell you a few words about the Alejandro Lopez Ortiz uh, Best Paper Award. So the award was first given at Latin 2018. It's named after Alejandro Lopez Ortiz, a prominent researcher of our community whose untimely passing in 2017 was a great shock to all of us. And Alejandro Lopez Ortiz was also the chair of Latin 2010. Okay. For the Latin 2020 edition, the program committee members were invited to vote on the papers of their choice in two rounds. The two PC chairs did not vote. A short list of three papers was produced in the first round, and the winner was chosen in the second round of voting. And the Latin 2020 Alejandro Lopez Ortiz Best Paper Award has been awarded to the paper okay, Monotone Circuit Lower Bounds from Robust Sunflowers by Bruno Paspalotto Cavalar, Marino Kumar, and Benjamin Hosman. Congratulations to the authors. It would be great if we could give you this certificate in person, but for the moment, what we do is to send it to you digitally. And I can tell you that this digital certificate is made of very tiny bits. Congratulations. And uh, I ask everyone to, to unmute the mics to clap our hands. So I'd like to invite the authors to say some words. Bruno is Bruno or Marino Benjamin. Yeah. Um, is everyone listening? Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, I I speak on behalf of of my co-authors that um, we are very thankful and uh, we are truly honored for the sele selection of our work for this award. And uh, we also wish to thank all the organizers for the conference. It, was, it has been a truly nice conference uh, despite all their circumstances. Uh, thank you very much. Okay. Yeah. Well, I would like to invite Marcus Kiwi, chair of the Emory Simon Test of Time Awards Selection Committee to proceed with the award session. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay. Thank you, Flavio. Uh, thanks uh, everyone for coming to the ceremony. First, uh, let me tell you a bit of history. The Imbra Simon Test of Time Award was instituted in 2012. It is given to papers deemed to be of highly significant uh, and lasting influence. The legible papers must have been published in Latin's proceedings at least 10 years prior to the current edition of the conference. So the award is also a, an opportunity to celebrate the life and work and achievements of Imbra Simon. This picture in the internet that you can, I hope you're seeing. Um, and, and, and a way of acknowledging uh, his relevance in building the Latin American theoretical computer science community, and in particular, setting up the Latin conference. This will be the fifth time the award is given. The award takes into account, among others, the following criteria, general impact on the field, including the influence on existing new lines of research, in, uh, originating from the work, number, quality, and context of citations, applicability, and impact on other research or practical areas. 
So I had the honor of presiding over the three member award committee uh, designated by Latin steering committee. The committee was comprised also by Conrado Martinez. I'm supposed to show them, but it's difficult to do this here, but it was comprised by Conrado Martinez, Jack Sakarovich and myself. I would like to express my gratitude to both of them for their very diligent and thorough work and the many meaningful, insightful and meaningful discussions we had. On behalf of the award committee, I also thank the steering committee for the trust they placed on us three. So we started deliberations. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about the process. Uh, we started deliberations early September, 2019 and worked quite intensively for two, point, uh, two and a half months. We first collected bibliometrics. Some had been gathered by previous committees, but here Ricardo's magical skills and abilities for collecting and processing data was key in, in enriching our perspective and discussions. Uh, we also put out a call for nominations. This is the first time such a call has been made. We warmly thank the community for uh, the response and we encourage really future award committees to keep soliciting nominations. So we first put together a, a list of potential candidates. Then we worked on pruning the list down. We got to five papers. We carefully read those five papers and then we narrow it down to even three papers. And then Jack undertook a, uh, Jack's, uh, undertook a really tremendous job of combing through not the number, but the context in which it, each of the three papers were cited, which allowed us to better assess the depth uh, and the contributions of each of them. So by mid-November, we converged on a winner. Amazingly, that was our self-imposed deadline. Ironically, we wanted to inform the award recipients as early as possible so they could uh, arranged to attend Latin in Sao Paulo, but even the 13 month advance warning was ineffective against the pandemic. Uh, this year's Imbra Simon test of time award winner goes to the paper from Latin, goes to a paper from Latin's first conference, which took place coincidentally also in Sao Paulo, in person though that was, but 28 years ago in 1992 and was chair actually by Imbra Simon himself. Um, let me change the, so um, yeah, the paper's title uh, is Irregular Expressions into Finite Automata and its sole author was an Brueggemann claim. I would like to express my heartfelt congratulations to Anne for the award. I'm delighted that she could join us in this virtual ceremony and tell us about her paper's motivation and context. And afterwards, uh, on behalf of the award committee, Jack Sagarovich will share with us some words about the significance of Anne's contribution. So Anne, whenever you're ready. <clears throat> I'm going to share my screen. I think I'm allowed to. Apparently, yes, that seems to work. Okay, yeah, so <laughs> of course, I'm extremely honored to receive uh, this uh, award and uh, it's a fantastic tradition. I was at this first conference in uh, 92, obviously, and um, I have very good memories of the community and the city. And it's a pity that I can't be there again, <laughs> but um, there are, I think, worse things than, than that. Um, I just want to talk a little bit about the, the context of this uh, work. Uh, it comes from the um, field of document engineering, actually. And there are these things that are called document grammars in standards that are called SGML and XML. And I'm not really talking about these, but uh, I was just want to mention that uh, the work goes back to these, uh, uh, to these document grammars. And they consider something that is called deterministic regular expressions. 
and they have a pretty vague definition of uh, determinism. It is defined operationally um, in the following uh, sense, and I've uh, replaced every term that um, is connected to documents uh, with the normal uh, in this context, um, uh, formal languages term. So to, de to, be uh, to be deterministic for an expression means a symbol that occurs in the word of a regular expression's language must be able to satisfy only one occurrence of that symbol in the expression without looking ahead in the word. Okay. And in the standard um, SGML, there is some allusion to finite automata also, um, but um, uh, I think it is not completely apparent uh, how this relates to automata. But um, it's, um, the, the, this condition can be actually formalized with the help of what has been called position automata by Zakharovich that's a kind of finite automaton non-deterministic that was originally, I want to say, discovered because it's such a natural entity by, by Glushkov in 1961. And uh, that's um, an automaton that, in a sense, naturally represents a regular expression so that one can actually, by looking at the expression, one can see the automaton. So I'm doing uh, the construction here for this expression, A star, B star, and this posi position automaton has one state for each occurrence of a symbol in the expression. There are only two in this case, A and B, plus an initial state. And then one can go um, maybe from the beginning, uh, um, what um, symbols can be matched or satisfied in the sense of SGML by starting here uh, from the beginning of the expression or the beginning of this automata. And one has the option to go to, to A basically, or to go to B with a transition on A or B. So this would lead to these two states or one can do nothing and already be finished. So the empty word is also accepted. So we make this an empty state also. Then uh, one can go on, okay, for um, uh, this state, if one is in a sense here at this position, what are the options to do? One can stay in the state by using the star operator here, or one can go to B, or one can finish. So that um, gives these additional transitions here, and then of course we can finish this for the last position. So that's in a sense a very natural um, um, uh, equivalent this type of automaton um, for an expression and one can then define that an expression is deterministic if and only if its position automaton is deterministic. So that raises the question uh, how difficult is it to compute this automaton and um, one might hope by looking at this initial construction that one can get an output sensitive construction that adds in each step of the algorithm one transition and only touches each transition once. And uh, that's just a nice hope, but it's not that easy if we have a stars, star operator. Because if you have a, in general an expression, uh, an automaton for an expression E, and then we want to compute the automaton for E star, then we must uh, theoretically add like a feedback loop from every final state to every state that can be reach, reached in a single step from this one unique initial state. And then of course we don't need, we don't know uh, as an algorithm if these transitions were already in this automaton present and if we are therefore uh, touching a transition for a second time or maybe even even worse so um, and uh, if we look at our example here if we go now from uh, the original e to e star then all transitions in this case that were in this uh, e automaton were already feedback transitions and um, the only new transition that we 
might legally add <laughs> is this one, the red one, and all the others we will also add if we just go naively about it, but uh, they will then be a redundant addition, additions, of course. And this is solved in the paper by transforming the ex uh, expression E into what uh, I've called star normal form and the um, expression in star normal form is then called E dot. And uh, the special property of E dot is that first of all, it has the same position automaton as E. So that's what we can want to construct. And uh, in E dot, all the feedback uh, transitions that are introduced during the construction are new. So there are uh, no superfluous, superfluous insertions of these feedback transitions and this kind of um, uh, um, expression in star normal form. It has, in a sense, been gutted. So it doesn't have these transitions anymore. And that um, gives us uh, the new result that position automata for regular expressions can be constructed in time that is quadratic in the size of the expression. Of course, we assume finite alphabet size, which is maybe <laughs> also um, a theoretical assumption, but in that sense, it's then quadratic and it used to be the naive construction used to be cubic. And the construction is proportional in the size of the output, it's output sensitive. And to come back uh, to uh, this context where it all started uh, with document grammars and this uh, standard SGML, we can test in linear time if a regular expression is deterministic in the sense of SGML. There has then been um, more work in this area that um, is joint work with uh, Derek Wood. So we have uh, characterized the regular languages that can be represented by deterministic expressions. Uh, and for example, this language that only has A and B symbols, but the second to last symbol must be an A that is not uh, representable by a deterministic expression. We have also uh, considered uh, further operators that uh, SGML expressions um, have, uh, so it's not the minimal uh, set of operations that regular expressions have, but we have, for example, the shuffle operator, and we have found, for example, that um, uh, the um, uh, that the the languages that are uh, expressible by a deterministic uh, expression that has this shuffle operator and that those are uh, larger than the set of uh, uh, deterministic languages, so to speak, that can be accepted by one of the um, uh, regular expressions, deterministic regular expressions. And um, I'm, of course, <laughs> completely uh, thrown by this uh, award that is given me in the uh, area of formal languages and uh, for the uh, Latin bodin, body of work. But I'm also quite proud that this work was recognized by the uh, W3C um, in the uh, uh, follow-up standard for SGML called XML and it's cited there as uh, related work. And I believe that uh, this kind of work uh, provided a level of mathematical rigor in terms of concepts and reasoning in the W3C standards that is not present in all recommendations. And I'm very happy I was given the opportunity to invite people from this community. I didn't know um, until <laughs> just two hours ago that it was possible. And I'm very, very honored that uh, uh, a number of representatives from this community are also here. So, uh, yeah, I just uh, finished by thanking you for this incredible honor and also for the way you have um, made this um, uh, like a celebration for myself, not only with this uh, nice plaque, but also with flowers and the letter that came today. And I, yeah, I don't want to, want to 
talk any more about it because then I get very emotional, but I really appreciate this. Thank you very much. Thank you. Jack or um, yeah, I, I try. I suppose I'm able to share my screen. Oh, wow, wow, wow. Can you see it? Oh. Wow. Can you see it? Now, yes. yes, yes. It's okay? Yes. Okay, and you see the, <clears throat> the pointer, more or less? Now we can only see the pointer, actually. <laughs> you, you, don't, you, you don't see the slides? No. Not yet. It's black now. Well, we will um, see it before. Okay, yeah. it's yeah. better oh. like that. Yes, no, no, it's okay. Okay, so apparently it doesn't work with the uh, um, how do you say the full screen option, but never mind. Okay, so I have to say a few words, and I'll try to be as quick as possible to explain uh, why we. Uh, more, uh, why we choose uh, uh, this paper and the result it contains uh, at uh, um, the award of, for the Emory Simon test of time. Um, so we are in the realm of the Kinney, the Kinney theorem. So we are in the formal language and automata theory and Kinney theorem is certainly the most basic uh, result and the fundamental result. You probably, most of them have <coughs> heard about it. So I will just to say, few, so I call A the alphabet, A star the set of words and L is any language a priori. And I shall just write reg E of A star is the regular expressions of A star and reg of a star is the set of regular languages of a star. And accordingly, out of a star is the set of finite automata of a star, and rec of a star is the set of languages accepted or recognized by uh, finite automata. Okay, so here are the set of languages. Okay, and now, so here we have the set of regular expression and every expression denotes a language and then is defined the set of regular languages. Oh, sorry. And here are the set of uh, automata of a star. Here is an automaton and the set, uh, an automaton accepts a language. And so the set of automata defined the set of recognizable languages. And what Kinney theorem says that both sets are equal. Okay. And how did that work? Uh, in fact, you start from an automaton and you, you compute a, an expression uh, that denotes the same language as the, the, <coughs> as the one that is recognized by the automaton that prove the inclusion in one direction. And now the other direction, you start from an expression and you compute an automaton from that expression that denotes the same language, that recognize the same language as the, <coughs> as the language denoted by the expression. So both together that gives you the uh, Kinney theorem. And at this point, I would, <coughs> this is in fact a very, very general, uh, result, it tells somehow that the, what you can do with a finite automaton, that is a finite di directed graph or the, <clears throat> the 
<clears throat> the computation they can be performed are exactly what you can describe as computation by a regular expression. And this goes over much uh, many structure and in particular to uh, any uh, the automata with multiplicity and the expression with multiplicity and the correspondence is exactly <coughs> preserved by this construction. Uh, well, mutatis mutandis, okay? So, and this <coughs> implies that we can forget about the languages in fact. What is important are the expression on one side and the automata on one side. And we are, ex <coughs> and we are interested on the algorithm that go forth and back. And if today we are interested by the <clears throat> by the algorithm that go from expression to automata, okay? Okay, most of you probably have heard about the Thompson automaton and the Glushkov automaton, that, that the one that uh, Anne just called position automata as uh, I talked to her, uh, but uh, probably you, you know this automaton under the, the name of Glushkov. Okay, and in fact, these two constructions are closely related because if you close, that is, if you suppress all the uh, uh, epsilon move, the spontaneous transition in the Thompson automaton, if you do it correctly, you will get to the uh, <coughs> Glushkov automaton. Okay, so we can forget about uh, the Thompson automaton. And in fact, in many, many, many uh, uh, algorithms, uh, uh, most of the implementation uh, are for building a Glushkov automaton uh, from an expression. Or there are plenty of vari variation about it to get smaller automata, more compact, but essentially it's the Glushkov automaton that you get. And people have tried to, so to get more compact automata, but essentially the uh, algorithm is always cubic as uh, Anne already mentioned. So the work of uh, the star normal form, the work of Anne consisted and this is, it's very unique in that direction to build, to st not to try to, to work on the attention you get, but to transform, this is syntactic transformation of the expression. You start from an expression and you build another expression. And this expression has the property that if you apply the same algorithm for the, to build <clears throat> the Glushkov automaton, you get to the same automaton. And now the difference is that starting from that expression is now the algorithm is quadratic. And because this transformation from E to the star normal form of E is linear, it's obtained by a uh, traversal of the syntactic tree of the automat uh, of the expression, then all together we get a quadratic algorithm. And in fact, now most of the uh, uh, of the algorithm that are actually implemented to get from an, from an expression to an automaton, take that path. And so in, in many of the uh, <coughs> quoting paper that usually they were working on, I mean, transformation of expression to automata. And the first basic step is to use this transformation to get an algorithm, which is quadratic. And so in that sense, uh, this work uh, <coughs> perfectly fits one of the uh, requirement of the test of time is that uh, it's really, it has been applied many, many, many times. Uh, and 
I, th I think that already that would suffice to uh, uh, give the, the, the award. But I would like to say more than that. Uh, for, so there are other automata. There is a very interesting, but probably less known uh, automaton that can be built from, from an expression. It's obtained by, let's say, construction which I consider is due to both Brozovsky and Antimirov. And it, it gives an automaton that can be called, of course, Antimirov, Brozovsky, Antimirov, or de I prefer to call it derived of automaton, which is a, which is a quotient of, this, uh, of the uh, Glushkov automaton. And so you have a direct algorithm that goes from the expression to the automaton, to this automaton. And you can also go from, from the expression to the, uh, <clears throat> to the Glushkov automaton and then take the quotient. So this gives a, another central position to uh, the Glushkov automaton. And this algorithm is more complicated and some authors claim that they have a quadratic implementation, although I don't know any uh, implementation uh, that beats uh, these, uh, I mean, the, the way, the computation of the star normal form and, to, and the Glushkov automaton. And so, what happened with this schema, we, we see that in fact, the star normal form of an expression uh, has a position, which is, uh, I mean, it is the true counterpart of the Glushkov automaton uh, of the expression. It's kind, it's not exactly, but it's kind of a, uh, let's say canonical expression corresponding to this uh, uh, automaton. So I think it has a, a real theoretical significance. Uh, and another thing is that whereas all this construction of automata uh, goes over to any generalization uh, with the multiplicity, this is not true of the star normal form. And it's not likely that uh, such a star normal form exists for Multi for automata and expression with multiplicity, which makes it once again uh, more special. I hope that I have convinced you that uh, uh, this uh, uh, work was really worth to be uh, awarded by the Imre Simon test of time. And I would finish with uh, uh, a few words, if Marco uh, allow me two minutes, uh, with the photo that uh, Yoshiko very kindly sent to me. It's the uh, group photo of the first Latin uh, conference where one can see uh, Anne, uh, Imre Simon, well, uh, Yoshiko has sp spotted me also. Well, there's the first thing that to be seen that we were all much younger than now. Okay. And uh, okay, on this photo, you will recognize many people, many friends. And I think it's another feature is that the organizing committee of this conference, uh, Yoshi, Yoshiko, Arnaldo, and Christina, they were all there. And somehow, I see that as another test of time of the work of Imre Simon. So, so he has really founded uh, a community which 30 years later is able to work and to continue uh, this uh, beautiful conference. I think that's, I think he would be certainly very happy and proud of it. And let me add two other things. So I was, on the invitation of Imre Simon, I was visiting Sao Paulo in uh, summer 
summer, the French summer, the, sun, uh, the Brazilian winter uh, of 91. So, and at that time, Imre was very, very busy with the organization of this first conference. And it was somehow uh, quite a revolution because Imre explained to me that he was able to organize it because he put it, he used uh, for the one of the first time, but I think the first time the conference was uh, using internet. That is, there was no uh, personal meeting of the program committee and it was the first, first time such a big conference had no uh, a real meeting uh, of the program committee, but it was just by mail. And all the paper were sent by mail, whereas in all other conference uh, at that time, they were sent by postal mail and uh, there were paper and you had to copy it and so on. And Imre told me that we could not have the money for organizing comic, the, the conference if uh, it had to be uh, done in a classical way. And it's be because Imre was very much involved on using Unix and yet part of his work was really uh, with <coughs> building, uh, I mean, using uh, Unix system. Uh, one of his work was to build a file system for Unix and unfortunately was not able to complete it because he's untimely uh, passing away. And so this somehow 30 years ago, it was a very revolutionary conference. And now we have this Latin conference, which is also of a new kind. And it, it still works, but I want to end with a warning. It works very well because we all know each other. I mean, I mean, I, I've met you. Uh, so all those people that are my friend, I can uh, recognize many of them. And it's fine with me if I see them on the screen. But uh, I think we should uh, uh, try to have maybe not all conference, but some of them still in present uh, in person, so that we can keep uh, the real uh, relationship. Okay, I thank you very much. I don't know. Oh, I can. I don't know how to close my. Should you say stop share somewhere? This green where, but where? In a green. You go back to the Zoom, to the Zoom interface. I, I am on the Zoom. But on I the don't bottom the part, I think. On the bottom part. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But so it does change. No, press share screen. And... Share the oh, green. Okay. Yeah, okay. Oh. No, yeah, I have it. Yeah, I have it. <clears throat> Is that okay? Yes. Yes, I took over. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh... Thank you, Yoshi. Thank you, Saka, Thank you, for the very nice Thank you, everyone. Talk. Thank you to everyone. Uh, okay, I'm the secretary for the business meeting. So, uh, Yoshi, as the, one of the chairs of the conference, is going to speak a little bit about uh, the conference. And so, Yoshi, the word is yours. Okay, thank you very much. So, Right, so welcome to the business meeting. So the agenda is like this. So there will be a report of the uh, Latin 2020 chairs, the PC chairs and local arrangements chair. And then there will be a presentation of the steering committee and any other item that the attendees, the participants that you would like to raise, 
can be added at the end of the meeting. Uh, right, so here's the very quick report of the uh, PC chairs. So the program committee had 50 members. Uh, we had uh, 184 external referees. We produced at least three reports for all the 136 submissions. Uh, the PC chose 50 papers, accept, accepted 50 papers for inclusion uh, in this conference. This gives an acceptance rate of something like 37%, well, rounding down, maybe it's something like one in three papers. These 50 papers involve 151 authors and the number of countries represented in the 50 papers is 29. Uh, okay, next. Um, classifying the papers by area, and of course this is kind of um, subjective maybe even in some cases because papers will range, will uh, encompass, could be classified in several places. But anyway, we have to decide how to classify them, even because um, the lecture note series requires us to do it. So anyway, so we classify the papers in some ad hoc manner, and we have this uh, distribution. So approximation algorithms, we have seven papers, and then seven papers in computational geometry, six in algorithms and data structures, and so on. Uh, very good. So this is distribution among the areas. Um, well, so one of the main aims of Latin is, well, maybe I can think of two, maybe the two major aims is to be a good theoretical computer science conference. Uh, but the second aim, which is just as important as the first, is to promote the area of uh, theory, theoretical computer science in the, in the region, in Latin America. So therefore, uh, we kind of keep track of things like how many papers have Latin American affiliation. And so you see that in this edition of Latin, in Latin 2020, we had 11 papers with at least one author with Latin American uh, affiliation. So that means 22% uh, of the accepted papers. And seven papers have all Latin American uh, affiliation. Uh, very good. Now, another way of looking at the Latin American participation is to look at the submissions. So here in this picture, you see on the left here. So this is uh, the universe of submitted papers, the 136. Uh, you can see here that, uh, so here in Europe, this is something like 34% maybe. So you see that 34% of the submitted papers come from Europe. Uh, now, if you look at the second column, among the accepted papers, European papers are something like 33%, let's say. Anyway, so that's how you read this graph. Uh, now, so if you look, uh -huh, maybe I should say one more thing. So how do you classify the papers as European or Latin American? Actually, this is not what you do. You do the following. So you, for every paper, you look at the authors and let's suppose you have a paper uh, with one Latin American author and two European authors. Then we count that paper as one third Latin American and two thirds European. Uh, so that particular paper, let's say, contributed two thirds to 136. That's uh, counted. Uh, you add them all up and then you get here this point. And uh, that paper counted one third for Latin America. I hope it's clear. Anyway, so this is this gives some measure of Latin American participation or European participation, and so on. If you look at this picture, maybe you you can have some conclusions. But uh, I think instead of looking at it uh, as a Latin American, instead of looking in a negative way, I think it's a kind of I think there is a positive side to it. So you see that um, the proportion of Latin American submissions is quite high. That means that, uh, well, maybe next time we'll have more accepted papers from Latin America and we'll have more represent Latin American representation in the, in the conference. So I kind of, uh, I was a little bit reluctant to show this picture, 
but I think there is a positive side to it. Namely, there is room which we have, uh, we can improve. So Latin America can improve in terms of participation in the accepted papers. So I think that's the positive way of looking at this. Now, looking at the trend of Latin American participation in the accepted papers. So this is now a graph starting from the first, from first Latin in 1992, uh, Chile, then back in Brazil in 1998 and so on uh, up to here, 2020. So yeah, so there is, let's say a stable participation of, of Latin America. And if you're optimistic, you can kind of look kind of towards the end of this graph, some increasing trend. If we can keep that, I think that would be lovely. Good, so looking at trends, uh, we can also look at uh, the number of submissions, number of accepted papers and uh, acceptance rate. So this orange graph is the acceptance rate. So Latin 2020 has like, uh, it's this point here something like 37%, which happens to be the overall average acceptance rate of this series of conferences. This point here is that. Um, good, um, moving on. So now thinking about geographic distribution. Uh, so this is us now, so Latin 2020. Uh, I think you, I think it's true that we are getting more mixed. Uh, and I kind of think that is a good thing. So we have representation from all uh, parts of the world and we are kind of perhaps converging to something. Uh, that's another way of uh, kind of thinking positively about this. Certainly this blue light curve shows this. Um, trend in increased participation of Latin American papers, uh, which I think is good. Uh, well, I really don't have much more to say. So you can look at this data actually in some website. So uh, this is a website of this series of conferences, the Latin, the Latin TCS page. Uh, actually, if you go here and uh, click for instance here, you really have detailed data about the accepted paper. So you can go here and you look at, uh, I don't know, ah, yes. So I thought I would click here in Brazil. Then you can see the authors from Brazil of this uh, Latin 2020. Mm, I clicked some people here, so I <laughs> first. So here I clicked, let me see. I clicked at uh, Leuto, okay, so you can see that he has a paper in Latin 2020, two papers, then one in 2016 and one in 2014, for instance. And here you see the paper. Uh, right, so there's a lot of information here and uh, it's kind of useful. Uh, and uh, I think that concludes my, my report. And uh, let me, yes. So uh, now, uh, yes, I hand over it back to Christina. Okay, so now we'll have a report uh, on our main lo local organizers, the young people that help us so much, Carla and uh, Guilherme. So Carla is going to take over now. Okay, um, thank you, Chris. So on behalf of the local organization, I'm going to share some facts with you regarding the organization of this, uh, this event. So um, by January last year, we had it all figured it out. We had uh, the venue reserved. It was going to be this very nice place at the University of Sao Paulo. Uh, we were pretty much going uh, to pay the hotel for the welcome reception and for the invited speakers to stay. We bought some of the plane tickets already for the invited speakers. Um, we had this very nice place that was going to provide us 
food for the coffee breaks. We were going to provide professional child care service so the parents could relax and attend to the conference. And, and there was even a moment where we thought we were going to have to give some small hand sanitizer holders and masks in the conference flag. Um, of course, besides other, among other things, we were also going to give some Brazilian sweets. And as all great conferences, also an iPad. Um, just kidding, we were going to give you a plug adapter because Brazilian's outlets are really weird. So we had everything kind of working for us. And then on 1st of March, we opened the registration. Uh, and two weeks later, uh, things started closing in Brazil. So we decided to put registration on hold. We were not sure of how things were going to happen, what was going to happen. Then in April, we would decided to postpone launching to, to this year. Uh, but we were still thinking that it was going to happen in person. So, but in any case, we started refunding registrations because prices would change. And then uh, we, we had to spend some time handling paperwork regarding funding because we had to extend the deadlines and things like that. Uh, but in August, we had to take this decision that Latin would be held online. And uh, January seemed the, the best date for that. Uh, but of course, we still had to talk with everybody in the steering committee and also with all the invited speakers to check with them if this, date, this new date would be okay. And uh, I'd like to thank all the invited speakers. All of them, uh, they were available to, to still give their talk. So I thank them very much for that. Uh, and then we have more funding issues to, to, to attend to in October. We spent some time, so we were going to do an in-person uh, thing and now we're going to be online. So we had to uh, take care of some stuff. And of course, the big question was, how do we do this online uh, conference? Maybe we give a lot of Zoom links and everybody uh, goes there. Uh, and then in November, Nicole, uh, which is one of the invited speakers, actually, she came to us uh, and talked about this virtual chair. And we uh, talked with her, we, we take a look around in the gather thing, and we thought it would be really nice to do, uh, to do the, the event in virtual chair. And in December, pretty much everything happened. I guess you noticed that due to the amount of emails that we sent you, but um, everything seemed really okay. And now here we are. Uh, I also would like to share with you some numbers regarding registrations. So the total of registrations were uh, 100, 189. And uh, I'd like also to, to mention that all of the authors were registered and all of the authors are here uh, and they um, I, I'd like to thank them very much for being able to give their talks uh, even though the proceedings are already published they they are all here to give their talks so this is really nice we thank them very much um, just to to uh, give you the the numbers per continent so we had a total of 50, 15 registrations in Asia, uh, most of them from Japan. We have a total of 37 registrations in Europe, and most of them from France and Germany. A total of 24 registrations in North America, most of them from the United States. And 130, 13 uh, registrations in South America, most of them here in Brazil. So, just to give an idea, uh, from my records here, we the attendance is being an average of 65, 70 per people uh, per day. So this is a really nice number of participants also. And uh, regarding finances, I'm going to handle to Guilherme. He's going to talk with you a little bit more. 
So hi everyone, uh, I just want to talk a little bit about the financial part of our event. So I will start talking about the expenditure, about the cost of the event. So of course, when we decided to move our event to, uh, to be an online, uh, the costs were reduced. So let me give you some idea. And this is an approximation because the cost depends on the exchange rate and some extra taxes that we still don't know. But I think it's, it's pretty close to the reality. So for the registration and also for handling payments for us, we contracted the service of SBC, which is the Brazilian Computer Society. So this costs uh, about uh, 11,000 reais, which have this main part of 9,200 plus some extra depending on the number of participants. And as you all know, we decided to use the virtual, the virtual chat system, which costs for us $6,000 plus some extra charges, also depending on the number of participants. And for the Imri Simo Award, so as you saw, we, we tried to do our best and so we had this plaque uh, and also we had to deliver the, the plaque into Germany and also we got some flowers. And this was about 800 reais. And as my friend Carla mentioned, we had already bought some of the plane tickets. Uh, to be precise, we bought six plane tickets for the, for the invited speakers. We were able to cancel and and get reimbursed for five of these tickets, but one of them was not uh, non-refundable, so we had to, so we have to to deal with this cost. And for the awards, uh, for the Indy Simon Test of Time Award and the Best Paper Award, we gave this prize of five hundred euros each. And at last, for using this Zoom environment we have this cost of 363 Brazilian hats. So all of this adds up to around 62,000 Brazilian reais, which is around $11,500. So this is pretty much all the costs we had. And let me now tell you a bit about the income of the event. So since the costs were, were reduced uh, from the plan we had before for, uh, for a face-to-face -face event, we tried to do our best to get funding from agencies and from sponsorships so we can make the event more accessible to everyone. And then we asked uh, some funding resources for CAPES and FAPESP. CAPES is a federal funding agent in Brazil. So they gave us 16,600 reais for this event. FAPESP, we are still not sure how much uh, we will get, but it should be around 10,000 reais. And then we ask for sponsorships also, and we are very grateful to the companies B2W and Google, who gave each 10,000 reais for this event. And also we are very grateful to Springer uh, that covered the costs with the, for the prizes. And as you know, we decided to charge for, for each registration only 100 reais, which now it's about $18. So in total, we got 6,600 reais. And just to, to match the exact cost we, we have, we will use uh, the grant of some of uh, of the organizers to to match the precise amount of money we need to pay. And so, yeah, so this is pretty much what I, I would like to share with you. So now I, I gave back the floor to Chris. Okay, thank you very much, Carla and Guilherme. So now I'll give the word to the, so uh, Joaquin von Zurgat, is uh, representing the steering committee of Latin and is going to report on uh, the past decisions. So Joaquin, I can, can I'll, you share your screen? 
Yeah, I will try. Okay, do you see uh, my, my screen? Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, so uh, the, one of the most important things is first a big applause and thank you to the local organizers who in the face of the difficulties caused by this damn virus still managed to run a, a, a very well, uh, well performed conference. Uh, I have a few things to say uh, about the bylaws. Uh, a suggestion was made to me uh, concerning the, uh, the uh, connection between conference chair and PC chair and uh, the current uh, version is uh, somewhat asymmetric. The uh, conference chair appoints the PC uh, uh, a program committee and act, probably that's PC chair typo and acts as the, no, the conference chair appoints a program committee and acts as the PC chair. And to split the duties of conference chair and PC chair seems wiser. And uh, that would read the conference chair appoints a PC chair and they jointly appoint the PC. And uh, we'll still want to keep open the possibility of uh, both of the, uh, them uh, um, being performed by the one and the same person. So formally, we have to uh, we have to do a vote uh, in the business meeting on any amendment to the uh, bylaws. Uh, quite honestly, I don't know how to do that. Um, Sorry. So maybe I, I say what. Uh, so if you have any comments, uh, I mean, the participants have any comments, just write in the chat. I'm monitoring it and I pass to Joaquin as you write there. OK. That seems very good. Thank you, Christina. But still, uh, so I will take no comment as meaning that the uh, business meeting agrees to the proposed amendment. OK. Good. Yeah. Then the second is a, is a pretty much of a formal nature. Um, it refers to an old bylaw which entered in the first version of the bylaws when they were set up, and it describes the starting point of the of the uh, uh, steering committee. That is now sixteen years ago, and I think we can erase that. So the uh, proposal is to remove this obsolete bylaw. Uh, the one thing that I didn't like about removing it is that the last sentence reads that starting Latin 2004, Imre Simon is proposed as emeritus uh, SC member, steering committee member. Now, I still recommend to remove the whole uh, bylaw and um, put in another mention of Imre Simon in a different bylaw. Okay, so uh, is that good enough for this one? Okay, second, um, the second uh, uh, um, uh, change, or I think also the last one, is um, that the the awards that we give out, that we gave out about half an hour ago, uh, are not anchored in the bylaws. The proposal is to do this in a very brief fashion, namely bylaw 14, the Latin awards. The wording is the Latin conferences present two awards. First, the Imre Simon Test of Time paper award in honor, in honor of Imre Simon, the founder of the Latin series of conferences. The selection committee does chooses the recipient. And second, the Alex Lopez Ortiz best paper award. The recipient is chosen by the program committee. Okay, so that is a, a, the, the, my current proposal. Uh, I, we will eventually have to 
prescribe some implementation details. I wrote just below the bylaw, I wrote uh, the current text that you find on the, on the um, Latin web page. We may have to work this out a little bit more. There, there, some people pointed out some things that might be added. And there are no such rules as yet for the uh, uh, Alex Lopez uh, Ortiz Best Paper Award. Uh, so my suggestion is to adopt this new bylaw, then called number 14. So again, if anyone has any comment or suggestion, can uh, the person can write in the chat and we will give the, the award to the person later after talking is done. Okay, then the next point is just a trivial uh, notification. Uh, there is a job of electronic secretary uh, given in bylaw 7D and uh, I welcome Tasio Naya as the uh, new uh, holder of that uh, position. He has uh, spent a lot of time and effort on organizing both the conference, uh, the technical details of the conference now, and uh, also the Latin website. A big problem is the next Latin conference. The assumption is that we want one, uh, and uh, that unfortunately has, uh, there has been no move on that uh, until about two weeks ago, and in this short time I could not find a, a, a potential organizer. So uh, we should really have a presentation of sites at the current meeting for the next one and then vote on them. Uh, and we have uh, this, the, the past steering committee has failed in this. Uh, there's a new steering committee. There's a small change in, in uh, staff on the steering committee uh, and we will make all efforts to find a solution. The one thing that I would concretely say is that uh, we had the shift due to the Corona pandemic. Uh, to uh, this January 2021. So our next year could be 2022 or 2023. Uh, there's a tradition of avoiding odd years for conf potential conflict with the Lagos meeting. So my current proposal is that uh, the next Latin conference should go for late 2022. Uh, that is a, a considerably minor uh, thing compared to finding an organizer. So I, I mainly appeal to all attendees, all participants in the conference and their friends to contact me or the steering committee uh, if they want to or Is the sound a little bit bad? Yes. Hawking, uh, the Excuse sound, me? your sound was a little bit bad once you were asking for people to help us with the. Uh, I cannot. Uh, phone you, next. I can. Shawking, you seem to have a connection problem. I have a connection problem. But what can I do? Perhaps you, 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 you can take out the video from your site.
Uh, I will, will, will say just a few sentences about the steering committee. The steering committee consists of six persons, three members at large, two chair members. The longest time uh, members are Kirk Cruz and uh, Tuba Viola. They leave the steering committee this year, and I welcome the new uh, steering committee members, Ronaldo Martinez as the member at large, and Flavio Miyazawa as the chair member. Uh, Yoshi and Flavio shared the chair position at the current meeting, and uh, Yoshi had already been member of a steering committee in the past, and he asked uh, Flavio uh, to take on uh, the chair for the following uh, uh, three uh, Latin periods. Now I can I'm finished uh, with what I want to say. If you want me to repeat anything, Christina, please tell me. Okay, so maybe uh, we can just, uh, I can, uh, maybe you go to the first, the first proposal and we slowly check that nobody has comments on each of the bylaw proposals. So yeah, this is the first one, is a minor change in the, the way the PC, uh, the conference chair and the PC uh, right. chair. So if anyone has any comments on this proposal of change, the bylaw. I, I just, if you could explain it, who's the conference chair? The, the chair of the steering committee or? Let me, let me give you a definition by example. Okay. Yoshi and Fabio. Ah, okay. Yoshi and Fabio are the conference chairs at the current meeting. Okay. And, and we used to have conference chair equal PC chair. Yes. And proposal is to potentially at least to pull these two positions apart, still leaving the possibility of having them in union. So this adds flexibility to uh, sharing the work between conference chair and PC chair. Yeah, so the conference chair deals with, uh, so we had the local organizing, doing all the work. So the PC chair, the PC chair, conference chair is dealing with all of these parts of the conference organization. And the PC chair is more focused on the, the, the part of the selection of the papers and call for papers and all this. So in some occasions, it might be better to have two people. Oh, okay. Now the... I understand. No, it sounds perfect. Okay, good. Okay. Perfect, yeah. Okay, so if, uh, so first going through this one is, uh, so there are some comments in the chat. Just let me make sure that nobody is commenting on this. Uh, so I guess nobody uh, has any comments on this. And everybody's welcome to open the mic like Marcos did and uh, say something if they feel like. Uh, Conrado, to say Conrado something. wants to say something. About this bylaw? Uh, no. Well, not specifically about this bylaw. It's about, about the other, uh, other issue. But, uh, Related to this, uh, uh, I don't. I don't think it's necessary to, to to be more specific. There are also some situations where you have two PC chairs, two co-chairs. Um, I don't think it's a big issue to 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 this, to, to have that the bylaw gives a lot of details. So the way it's expressed now, I think it's it's quite useful. I mean. This idea of uh, of allowing to split uh, the conference chair on the one hand and the PC chair as as it's proposed, I think it's useful and it's it, it's it, it can also encompass other situations. 
So I think it's a, a good idea to, to have it. Okay. But I have another thing to, to, to tell uh, you uh, or to say, but this I will do later. I think that Alfredo had something to say about. Yes, the, yes. Yes, but so let me just uh, uh, resolve this bylaw changes and then we open to all the other uh, things that we mentioned and others that you guys had to say. So bylaw 10, if nobody writes anything anymore, we will consider that uh, the voting is in favor. And now for bylaw 14, so this uh, bylaw 14 that you read here, the proposal is just, uh, it, it's a local thing. So it's to delete this from the current bylaws. So that's the proposal. So if nobody has any questions on this, we'll move on to the next one, which is uh, adding another bylaw that refers to the two, two prizes. So the major change here is that uh, we are committing ourselves to have the, uh, the best paper award in every, uh, every edition of Latin, right Yoshi? That's the major change. Yes, I think that would be a major change. We are committing ourselves to have this award in every edition of Latin from now on. In the same way that we did with the Emily Simon Award. Well, the, formally, there is a decision to choose a recipient. And it's not uncommon that a selection committee or a program committee chooses no one as recipient. Yes, that, that, that is possible, but we'll still have to have the selection process anyway, every edition, in every edition. Yeah. Even a Nobel Prize recently, recently was not given. Uh, the, the one concern here could be the cost of the awards. But that could be, uh, one could um, add rules about these awards that say, basically say, uh, if there is no, if the conference does not have the, the financial background to pay anything for the awards, then, uh, then there will be no financial side to the award. It, uh, just to, to jump in in support of the best, of adding this, the best paper award as a regular thing. Um, yeah, I agree that, that the chair always has a right to say, well, there's no paper that I'm really sufficiently excited about. But the, the argument for why best paper awards are good is that they support the whole community because you, know, you take one or two or, or you know, how, some number of people now has an award and universities like awards. And, and so, we're really helping members of our community by having the best paper award. And that's something that I would like oh. to do. And, and if there's no money for it, so what? Yeah, absolutely. And the, the rule says nothing about the, the money. <laughs> so that's, I, I, I totally agree, Michael. Totally agree with you. I, I also agree with that. It's just that, you know, it's, it's very tough not to declare uh, um, an award like a vacant. So in, in general, but it's fine for me that the way it's written up. I, I just have a question whether the steering committee considered um, a, stating more precisely how the selection committee will be will work or be chosen or, or, or is this is left for the future essentially? The idea is that we're going to discuss this uh, and come up with uh, something in the lines we have for the Imri Simon Award. And, and we can share, I, I guess we can share that with the community also in, the, in some way. 
to consult. No, but for for the for the in assignment test of time award, there's no. It's not written anywhere where how the selection committee kind of works. Exactly, uh, Chris. I, I think uh, on the first one for the Imbre Simon, right? I think you, uh, it's better to indicate that the steering committee will be the one selecting the committee. Um, the other one is clear. The PC is doing it and, you know, yeah. may declare, you know, whatever. If there is no money, pay no money, but they still get the award. You still say you won the award. Yeah. Um, so I, I, but I would only add on the, on the Imbre Simon, I would add that the steering committee chooses the selection committee for, for this. Daniel, I think it's written below. I was going to say uh, the same question. I think it's written below that the steering committee chooses. But Only- it says in, it says in the by the steering committee. Oh, okay. Sorry, yeah, yeah. Ah, okay, because it's okay. end of by law, right? Okay. End of Good. by yeah. law. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yes. Oh, ah, Good. okay, okay. So, but I think I, I, I agree. We don't. No, just one comment. Uh, I think it's not by the bylaw, but I think it would be good to have at least one, what most, one repeating member from the previous uh, committee. It helps to the history, to help to, I, I don't know. For me, it's good to have somebody to keep history of previous way of thinking, of discussing, unless I think this committee made a great job in writing things, in writing <laughs> criteria, et cetera. But uh, I think it, it, it's useful, but not for the bylaws, but just for general criteria. But it's only my opinion. And I want to congratulate again, all the work done by all those committee is not trivial at all. Yeah, so traditionally we kept uh, always, I think, two members from the previous uh, or at least one member of the previous. Uh, well, yeah. Yes, no, that's, yeah, that's, that's true. We have that's that. true. Yes, we, can, we can write that down. We can write that down and, and change a little bit the, the, this part and add this explicitly. Yeah, so maybe at least one would be better. I know that doesn't have to go into a bylaw, there will be uh, a part uh, somewhere on the Latin web page, there will be the rules for the two awards. And uh, I think they need a bit more of discussion. I wasn't ready to, to make a final uh, uh, proposal here. We, we will have to discuss that with, uh, the, within the steering committee, with the previous selection committees, uh, and and so on, and we will do that. Sounds good. Okay, so this is for bylaw, the new bylaw in the place of the fourteen. And the next one, Hawking, would you go down a bit? Um, yeah. Ah, no, that's a, only an indication. And maybe I would like uh, Tasio. Are you around just to say hi to people, Tasio Naya? Hi, hi, people. <laughs> hi, everyone. So this is Tasia Naya, who, who already is working, in fact, before the indication, <laughs> but now he's officially indicated. Yes. Nice, right, thanks. <laughs> Let me just add, so we inherited really lots of great work from Marcos and his team, and uh, so Tasio worked on it. But it must be said that, uh, I mean, this the, the basis was really very firm, uh, but of course, uh, software needs improvements or uh, what, modernization and things like that. And uh, so I think Tasto will have lots of work uh, ahead of him. But thank you very much, Marcos, for a very long time looking after this. And then Christina was the secretary, right? So- Yes, yes, Christina was, also did a lot of work. It's really a lot of work. So thank you very much to all of you and thanks to Nasio, Tasio. And now the next one is the one that uh, I think uh, uh, Tuba had something to say. It's the, the next conference, right? And, the, and more precisely, the time when we are going to do the conference. 
the side so what uh, so the sound of Joaquin was not very good exactly when he was asking for I mean if you know someone in Latin America some group that uh, could be willing to host Latin uh, you uh, we would be very happy to receive suggestions uh, but we'll look for them as well uh, more thoroughly and but uh, about the time, so Tuba, did you have something to say about the proposed? Uh, thank you very much. This is very dynamical. I mean, all what's happened with the COVID, what's happened in the world, I mean, it's crazy. And we don't know exactly how things will evolve. But there is something that we have to think a bit, at least next uh, steering committee, is in this sense. Uh, April is a well-established time for Latin. April in even years, okay? People know there in general, it's a good time if people can travel and come here. I mean, it's not because of anything that it was April. Going to October for one more time because of this complicated issue is okay in the sense that we are advancing three months in relation with Latin Latin 2020, <laughs> in the sense, three months ahead. But I think we have to make an effort in order to think well the date of the conference, in order not to collide with other conferences, in order to agree with other theoretical conferences in the world. And sometimes we adjust a bit some dates, for example, in order to keep and get important paper that may not be accepted at Fox or Stock to say something. I mean, date is, is not trivial issue. The other non-trivial issue is now that we are very delayed, I don't know, it's a, it's a pity, but we are very delayed in order to choose the next place. So in general, we gave six months advance, etc. but why thinking in, in terms of having the conference in April. Now we are having it in uh, uh, in January, so it's nine, eight or nine months uh, delayed already. So there is a kind of transition, and there is also a kind of general policy about when to to organize the conference. For my part, it's not good to overlap with Lagos. I think it's good to have different uh, years, but. Uh, Perhaps we should have, because I don't know, this is very dynamic, I don't know what's going on, uh, some transition times now in October or September, but this should be agreed with the people who organize the event. We, we first have to find somebody who is willing to organize the event, organize the conference, and then we can arrange with them uh, the, the time. If possible, it would be good to think ahead two years is not easy, but I mean, two, 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 two events, no? But only because of this timing, I think that uh, Joachim said uh, next Latin, not as a general policy. So, I mean, it's okay. But I think this date should be thought in relation with the organizers, because perhaps if we have organizers who can do things a bit fast somehow, we could move a bit ahead. And I think we should converge to April as always. But I mean, it's only my opinion. Thank you. Okay, does anyone has, have yeah, comments this, on this? I think that uh, April is good for 2024. But for the next one, we cannot do as if we have to react in some way. And uh, in the proposal, you have also uh, 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 some margin between October and December. So you, you, are, you, you will be asking the organizers of the following two editions of Latin to uh, have uh, like three or four less months to prepare things. Essentially, I think it's that, uh, but they, I think it's okay. Uh, actually, uh, 
it will be great if someone volunteers to, to organize like the next one because the situation is very complicated and uncertain. And it's, uh, I, I, I want to say here that the, the organization of this Latin has done a terrific job. I, I think that the, at the end we have to, to clap the organizers <laughs> Very, very, uh, very much because they, you've done a terrific job. But Tuba, uh, I, I don't, I don't understand your point. I think uh, it's uh, this is a, a, a traditional uh, proposal. It's not nothing has nothing to do with what will happen in the in, in 2004. Yes, you, you are right, Conrado. I wanted to say that only in order that this is for the future. And the only thing I wanted to say is that it would be good try to converge to, to April in the future. <laughs> this is, I, I, perhaps I didn't express it well, but I, 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 it's essentially that, Mark Conrado. Sure, sure, sure. So uh, the idea, my idea is to first find someone and actually leave them a choice. If they have preferences for certain dates, we will listen to them. Uh, I, here it says we should aim, which is a very weak expression, and also that the organizers actually uh, will basically determine mm -hmm. the date. And I also agree that from 2024 on, we should return to the April time frame. No, just Providing a question to Joachim. Sorry. I want to leave us alone. Yes. No. Just a question to Joachim and to just to understand which places have you asked in order to organize? If somebody would said I could organize later, if somebody has any place in mind, just to advance a bit in the organization for next time. Yes, so the, uh, the answers I got, oh, it's a wonderful idea and I would gladly help out anybody who actually organizes it. But my question, Joaquin, is where did you contact? You contact Chile? Who else you contacted? Uh, I, I, I don't want to say whom I contacted because that is uh, sort of private, refusing uh, an invitation. Uh, I, I, I will not divulge the names. Sorry. Oh, okay, okay, sorry. Okay. Uh, but in any case, we, we will welcome suggestions. Yes, this is the most critical thing in my view uh, for the near future, for the next uh, for the next year, sort of, for this year. Uh, we please come forward and point up and say, oh, I'd love to hold uh, the next Latin in my own hometown. Or Martin, Martin has something to say. Martin, do I see a I, candidate? No, 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 <laughs> no, no. I just wanted to make a remark about the date. Uh, yeah, this time it was supposed to be May, and uh, May would be ideal for people from North America because the semester is just over then. So it's close to April, but uh, a little bit better. Okay, on the date, we can consider that. Joaquin, sorry, I think I interrupted you. I... Uh, no, 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 no problem. No, no, that's the only thing I wanted to say, just uh, a, instead of April, maybe May could also be considered if it's suitable, uh, that would be an advantage to people from uh, the US and Canada. Okay, we are writing down everything here. Uh, Joaquin, uh, do you have more to say on this, uh, on the place and date of the next Latin? I do not have anything more to say. Mm. Okay. okay, so... Can I say something? Yes, sir. <laughs> Uh, well, our sister conference included France in Latin America, 
in one edition. Maybe given the circumstances, we could try to reach out to other friends, but that is a suggestion for the steering committee to consider. Yeah, and just to recall, I think it was, it has been four times in Brazil, twice in Chile, twice in Argentina, twice in Uruguay, um, once in Peru, and twice, so three times in Mexico, three times, I think, in Mexico. So thinking about the terms in, <laughs> in Latin America, maybe Chile would be nice, <laughs> but of course, uh, Marcos has organized it, and I don't know whether there are other groups there that you, we could contact, but uh, uh, in last year, I think we heard somebody from Colombia, right? But uh, then uh, I think uh, maybe it didn't work out, right? Somebody in Colombia that uh, maybe was planning to, but uh, they don't have much tradition to participate and organize. So maybe for this reason, they gave up. Yeah, anyway, I think it's the uh, work of the steering committee to go <laughs> and look for potential uh, organizers. Yeah, yeah, there is yeah I, I am somewhat surprised that people from Chile, I mean, there there is quite- group there's quite more people than it used to be. So uh -huh. um, I think it's more of an issue of personal circumstances. I, I, I just emailed Joachim asking him for a little bit of background. Maybe I can talk again to some of the people that I suspect were contacted or I know they were contacted and, and, and were not uh, willing to, to, to take the responsibility. Uh, yeah, I'll do that, but uh, let's see. Yeah, we'll be in contact, Marcos, but let me uh, take up a, a, a suggestion that just came up, holding it outside of Latin America, like in France. Is yeah, that uh, acceptable to the community at all? Uh, actually, it was... Uh, I, I was thinking, uh, Joachim, I cannot hear you. We have a, we have the chair right there. <laughs> so we have a candidate. <laughs> yeah. uh, I received, uh, and I received just a message from Sergio Rashbaum that maybe Mexico can help out if uh, needed. So, I guess we now have a few. So maybe Spain and maybe. Chile and Mexico, we can kind of talk around these suggestions, right? With the steering committee and the people who would be uh, the major organizers and see if we can merge to some of these places, no? So Conrado, you think you could uh, organize? Because it's good to know also because- No, I mean, no, 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 I, I was- <laughs> I was mentioning the, the fact that it depends how broad is the definition of Latin America. Like, it's oh, you know, we, we Latin Americans, we, we love everybody. Welcome Latin America. Everybody. We, can ex we can ex extend it to Hispano America. Yeah, or <laughs> is, is, it, is it the USA with uh, like maybe 20 million uh, Spanish-speaking uh, inhabitants, uh, part of Texas, Latin America nowadays. <laughs> Texas, Florida, Puerto Rico. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> of course, I, I, I don't think that, that Spain is uh, a Latin American uh, in any definition, but it's, it's, it's part of Hispano America. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> No, I, I, I was thinking on, on, on this, I, 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 I would love to have, for example, in Spain, etc. There are two issues here, but this is dynamically. This is why I say dynamically. The first issue is if the conference is online or is in the presence. If it is online, it can be done anywhere somehow, who is willing to, who has connectivity, and who is willing to work. 
So in this sense, it's, it's, it's easier. I hope not in the sense that I hope things are better, but if it is online, there are more flexibility to choose somehow. With respect to Spain, I would love to have it in Spain in, in, uh, in person. The only issue we have to see is in relation, but this is second, but just to see, in order to people to get the money to go, to go there, students, regional students, etc. But uh, for me, I, I, I would love to have uh, in Spain too, in other place. I was also thinking in France, in, in just in case, because we have a lot of French participants here and uh, people who work and are helping. But again, this depends if it is in presence or if it is virtual, in my opinion. I hope it's presence, but we never know. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I think I think one bad thing of doing it outside Latin America uh, is that it's more expensive for the Latin Americans to travel there. So even uh, we always notice that when it's in Mexico, the participation of Latin Americans from South America specifically uh, drops a bit. And we we already thought, oh, maybe it's because the tickets are way more expensive. So there are these issues also that interfere, but. But in any case, uh, given that we don't have a concrete proposal right now, I think uh, it's maybe interesting to consider this possibility also. But I also, like Tuba, I also hope that it's presential. I can't stand anymore this online thing. Um, please, um, if I may say something, I, I actually think this is a, a bad idea to take Latin outside of Latin America, I, I think defeats the purpose, uh, yeah. you know. Uh, so in my opinion, I think, I mean, uh, if there is absolutely no other choice, then maybe do it online. Yeah. You know, ah, organize okay. it in, in a place in Latin America that could have people around. Maybe some people can attend together in, in a room, you know, uh, wherever you have a, a, a larger number. Um, so I'd, I'd rather go with an option like that than, than going into Spain or France. I love to go to Spain and France, and I love to go anywhere from my house. But, uh, you know, I think it uh, defeats the purpose. Um, so I don't know. That's, that's my opinion. But, you know, of course. <laughs> I kind of agree. I agree with you somehow. I agree with you. If I understood Daniel well, I love this, just in case, mixing opportunities in the sense is to have in a place where we can meet together at least some people and have something a mixture of virtual and presence and I mean just to find something in between. <laughs> I, if I understood well, Daniel, I love the idea. <laughs> yes, this is going on, right? There are there are conferences that are being run uh, hybrid, right, hybrid way. So some people meet and others see it uh, online. Um, so, you know, I mean, this is something you can play by the ear, you know, if this continue or we have another pandemic next year, then you can, you can see other possibilities like that. And, and then maybe try to, to, to get some solid uh, place for, for the time, like, like 2024, how was commented, whenever we can actually meet in person, you know, and then play for that to have a real conference where we see people, you know, and, and do the things, uh, normal, you know, and then other way, just try to pass this awful time. You know, if it's, if it's this way, like having some local people that can manage to, to be in the place, uh, then do it like that. Uh, I don't know, it's a suggestion for the, for the steering committee, right? Uh, to consider that option too. I, I, I really think that was not in the spirit of Imre when thought about this conference uh, to, to, to have it, uh, outside Latin America I was wanting actually to develop groups and, and you know, and, and part of it is attending talks, even if you are not submitting because you are not at that level at the moment you are studying your you know, undergraduate, whatever, you can still uh, at least uh, see the people talking, see people like, uh, yeah. So anyway, that's my comment. <laughs> I think that everybody agrees that the right thing is to have this conference in Latin America. The only people that I'm not sure that they agree are the people that are asked whether they're on the conference. That's that. 
Yeah, but I think we we already have Marcos that's going to talk to us, and uh, Sergio Rashbaum also uh, kind of suggested himself. So I think we go from here, right? I think uh, at first, I, th I understand that the, our first goal is to try to find a place in Latin America, and we have two possibilities to look around. And if someone has other suggestions, please write to us. And, uh, and, then, and then we see we, what we can do to, for the 2022 edition. And then hopefully 2024 on is going to be more as it used to be before, hopefully. Is there a, a dollar possibility to have it in Sao Paulo? Naturally, I've done all the work now, and, but maybe the work would be a bit easier. Yeah, I've already explored the hotel and everything, and they just run it through again. In fact, we were contacted on this by the steering committee, and the, what, the, the answer was silence. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so I think everybody was kind of... Uh, exhausted from all the change and but but uh, hopefully we will have energy in a few more years again to to take over but it's uh... let me say something so yes i remember that and uh and the the young people in the committee so <laughs> guilherme and carla kind of immediately said, oh yeah, sure. <laughs> but the older people kind of uh, didn't uh, react so fast and then they forgot about it. <laughs> anyway, but I, I think uh, such a thing would be possible, but of course the, the chairs would have to be different. So. I think the steering committee with uh, all your feedback now has a good basis on which to go ahead, and, and we will do that uh, reasonably swiftly. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll use the contacts uh, uh, that were mentioned, and we'll be, uh, we'll be talking to, to those people. And uh, I hope that we can come up with a solution fairly soon. Great. So if we are done with this topic, then I want to finish just to uh, repeating the change in the steering committee. So the Kirk Pru and uh, Alfredo Viola Tuba, both of them are here present. Uh, so they are, uh, they, they, well, it finished the it, it was supposed to finish uh, in 2020, but in fact, it finishes when we finish this business meeting of the Latin 2020. And then the new uh, members are uh, Conrado Martinez, who already accepted, and who is the member at large, the new member at large, and Flavio Miyazawa uh, as the one of the we, uh, one of the chairs of the conferences, and this is according to the laws, of, the bylaws of Latin. Uh, does anyone has any comments or maybe want to speak? Oh, I want only just to say thank you very much for all the support. And I like it very much to work in the steering committee. It was very nice. And uh, I, I am very happy to have two people new people in the steering committee that can help to integrate new ideas, fresh ideas, and new blood somehow. And from my part, I want to say that I wish them the best, and I am ready to support and help in whatever is needed in the future. So it's very nice. And I want to thank Christina for sending me the mail to invite me uh, to be here. Uh, because uh, I, I, it was complicated, but thank you very much. So, and the, the, the last thing to congratulate all the organization and all the scientific committee and every details of this Latin is amazing. And after watching all Yoshi's presentation that I love it, it is completely, completely opposite of what's happening in Buenos Aires. I like it very much. And also with respect to how things 
evolved in relation of all the dynamical decisions for going to presence to online that is not trivial at all, all the support and all the scientific talks. I like it very much. It was very tough, but I like it very much, the keynote speak today. I congratulate them and it's far from trivial. And I like very much before leaving that Latin is in very good health, very good future. Okay, and keep going, working, and I am ready to help. Thank you very much, and I wish the best. Yeah, thank I, you. Thank you for all the other work. Yeah, I would like to also say the same about this business meeting. The organization and the presentations were, you know, very good. Uh, all, of everyone, the steering committee, the organizers, the chair, a very um, thorough, very interesting, very transparent. I I liked it a lot, uh, and I congratulate everyone for it. Thank you. Okay, does anyone wants to say some words more? Maybe we should uh, thank also Kirk for the years in the steering committee. I think he's here also, right? Yep, I don't have anything to say. Would... Just thank the local organizers, it was great. It was a lot of fun. Okay, very good. So anyone Thanks else want to say something? If not, we can join and gather in the gathering lob and chat around. Dance. We're not going to dance. <laughs> Brazilian conference. <laughs> Good, Marco. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So if the business, so I consider I, I declare the business meeting finished now uh -huh. but we, everybody is welcome to stay and chat more here in the zoom or in the gather okay thank you christina for, for your... thank you joaquin for your presentation for taking over no worries okay i'm about to leave bye, okay. Ciao, joaquin. bye bye everybody bye bye, bye, -bye. bye. Goodbye. Bye-bye. See you.